this this is this was my bar mitzvah. Oh, <laughs> that one. And this. Do you remember my, what you played then? No, I mean I took a picture. I don't know. I was studying at the time. Well, I used to play little concerts around. Oh, I played lots of difficult stuff. Well, I used to play concerts around uh, the New York area at the mm -hmm. time. And this is my wife and my son when he was four years old. Mm -hmm. He's now 45. Oh. And I have two grandchildren. They're going to, one is a junior at the University of Rochester, and my grandson just got into Harvard. So oh. it's a nice family. And, uh, Are they uh, musical too, like Grandpa? I, well, the music, uh, my grandson plays the violin quite nicely. Mm -hmm. And he, he only wanted it for himself. I'm delighted because he's just getting into chamber music and thinks, you know, when he'll be 40 years old, he'll be looking for a chamber music group yeah. instead of a poker game. Yeah. <laughs> and that that is, is such a beautiful thing. And he'll have something nice for the rest of his life. Yeah, yeah. He's a very bright boy. Uh -huh. So you're proud. My, of course, I, I would be proud if he weren't bright. Uh -huh, sure. But he has, um, he has his pilot's license. Really? Yeah. I mean, the parents don't like it at all. Yeah. He, he went secretly to take lessons. Too risky for them? Well, you know, every time you go up. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I feel also, I wish he didn't have a pilot's license. Who yeah. the heck needs it? To begin, I have a few questions. Yeah. But I hope they'll just help us to speak together and uh, converse. And if you feel like talking about anything, that's okay. We'll... You have enough tape. <laughs> well, because I yak like, I have... like an old woman. <laughs> <laughs> I have some extra, so... <laughs> I think I have one or two. I did want to begin by asking you, on the occasion of your 75th birthday, uh, I know you're still very active and busy, but probably you're reflecting back on your career, very distinguished career, and I wanted to know what some of the the high points for you were. Just things that, special occasions, events, well, and how you feel about Well, them. I tell you, the first high point is that I was a violinist. Yeah. And after playing the violin, mm -hmm. it's almost 70, it's about 17 years that I'm playing. Uh, I still love it. I still... Um, I still love playing chamber music. I give some concerts very rarely, though, mm -hmm. because of my very busy schedule at school. But that's number one highlight. Mm -hmm. You know, I have so many. The second highlight, the most, probably the most important, is that we emigrated to the United States from Russia. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was already then pretty oppressed. I went through the entire First World War as a child, and I knew nothing but trouble mm -hmm. and insecurity and, and unhappiness until we came here. What city were you from? And Brest Litovsk in Russia. Mm -hmm. I was born October the 28th, 1909. Mm -hmm. And so that was really a highlight, you know? And I owe so much to to, to, the, to this country, although I, I've lived here for so many years, but still, who knows, had my parents not emigrated, I probably, who I certainly wouldn't have been alive now because of what happened during the war in the part of the uh, of, uh, Russia where I live. They butchered and... and, and, and uh, killed and took the concentration camp. So many people of my of my race. And that was a highlight. And then you see I have so many highlights. Anything good that happens to me is a highlight. <laughs> well then I had a very good teacher, Vladimir Grafman. He's the father of Gary Grafman, the pianist. Oh, you yes. see? At Manus at the Manus College? He, no, I studied with him privately uh -huh. in New York. Well, he didn't teach at the Manus yet. Uh -huh. It's wonderful that you know that. Yes. Very few people know that. That's yeah. nice. And, uh, and then oh, I made my debut in New York. I was 16 or 17 years old. And then there were some wonderful people. 
who took an interest in me and <clears throat> sought the highest education that I could have, not only as a musician, but also as uh, a way of developing my character at a very impressionable age of 17. And, and so this is, was a great highlight. I studied with Eugenie Zai in Brussels. And that was really a highlight because the influence and the teaching of this great violinist, probably one of the greatest, many considered him the greatest violinist of the, of the century, um, was just a, a point that I cannot begin to tell you because they, you see, his lessons, for instance, were three hours every lesson. I had to memorize and come prepared for a lesson with an enormous repertoire every week. Now he'd say, the first week, he said, now all right, next week you bring the Bach Chagon, Symphony Espanol Lalo, and one of my own works by heart. Well, I practiced 10 hours a day. I don't think I've ever disappointed my teacher. And only through his wonderful interpretive teaching could I benefit from this, you see. Because he was a great uh, violinist, as I told you, but music making was the most important thing to him. And he would not have accepted me had I not been ready, technically, to assimilate all of his remarkable uh, uh, teaching. Well, I, I built up a wonderful repertoire. Mm -hmm. He was also a, a great human being. Mm -hmm. And being around him, <clears throat> one got, uh, I, I, I got a, a tremendous feeling of the fact that it's not only your playing all the time that counts. You must also be a human being mm -hmm. and how you treat your colleagues. And it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. He left a tremendous impact mm -hmm. on my life. Mm -hmm. And you know, there are times after 55 years that every once in a while, you say, oh my gosh, of course it's, it, it should have been played in a, in a different timbre. And I remembered what I was Something. told. Yeah. You see, it lasts all this time. Isn't that, isn't that the most wonderful? Ah, he was such a great man, such a great artist. And I studied his own works. I gave the first performance uh, of his sonata in D minor, the ballad. Mm -hmm. which is a staple in the repertoire today. Mm -hmm. you have, it's, I think there are about over 30 recordings of that piece. Was that in Brussels? That was in Brussels. Uh -huh. I remember the date. Mm -hmm. February the 23rd, 1928. Mm -hmm. Then I came back after about two and a half or three years of study and I came back to the United States at the height of the Depression period. Mm -hmm. Your family was still in Manhattan? That is, I went by myself. Or? Yeah, in, in New York, that's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Where I grew up on the Lower East Side of New uh -huh. York, you see. Th that was a uh, Russian or Eastern European area at that time, wasn't it? Oh, it was a melting pot. Yeah. Italian, Spanish, mm -hmm. uh, Jewish, uh, the, the Jewish population was from all over. Could be uh, Hungarian, uh, Romanian, Russian, mm -hmm. and oh, everyone congregated into this tiny area mm -hmm. because rent was about twenty dollars for a four-room apartment. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds it sounds terrific nowadays, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. let me tell you, it wasn't worth it then. <laughs> we had no hot water 
was a cold water flat. No bath and one toilet for four families on the same floor. Oh. And you, you say, oh, yeah, again, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> and it, it, it was a five-story walk-up, mm -hmm. which I didn't mind. I was young. I could do it ten times a day. Mm -hmm. It was difficult for my parents, you know, who were older and mm -hmm. so forth. But I went to school uh, on the Lower East Side also, uh, to the Seward Park High School. Mm -hmm. C-U-R-A-S-E-W-A-R-D, mm -hmm. named after the, uh, was it uh, Lincoln's uh, Secretary of the Treasurer or? Yeah, he was in Lincoln's cabinet. He was, was a Seward. Yeah, yeah, William H. Seward. Yeah. I don't remember what he, oh, shame on me. Yeah. You should know my history better than that. Well, and then, well, I, I skipped so. until I went to Europe. and. Coming back to the United States was very rough, mm -hmm. and uh, it was difficult to to obtain any sort of work. Oh, I went first. I played with the Minneapolis Symphony. I was mm -hmm. solos with the orchestra. I had fantastic reviews, mm -hmm. and that was nice, you know. And after mm -hmm. that, nothing. Yeah. Well, it's okay. I never got discouraged. I played musical comedy shows. I did anything that came my way to earn a living mm -hmm. for my family mm -hmm. and for myself. And uh, I happened to hit a wonderful musical comedy by Jerome Kern. And it was a chamber orchestra of which the orchestrator was Robert Russell Bennett, mm -hmm. a, a wonderful orchestrator and a very good composer in his own right. Mm -hmm. and. That show ran for 56 weeks, and I got $80 a week. I was a millionaire, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, and we saved, I supported my family, paid off debts, and even put a down payment on a wonderful violin, mm -hmm. you see, and a, and a Vion, ah. which I eventually bought. And uh, I don't have it anymore because when I bought my Stradivari, Mm -hmm. I traded in that and another Italian violin I owned. Mm -hmm. Well, that was much later, yeah. very much later. Then, the most wonderful highlight is when I auditioned for and got into the NBC Symphony Orchestra. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> it was inexplicable. My first You're about contact. Twenty or twenty. I was about twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. That time. How I, for the first time, the Toscanini came, his first downbeat, in the C minor Symphony of Brahms. And suddenly, I got shivers, goose pimples. I started to to quiver and shake. I don't know the what this man did and suddenly with one chord i think he changed my my whole outlook of music and that one moment oh, and then of course it continued mm -hmm. it got greater all the time that was his first rehearsal i stayed with the orchestra for seven years have you auditioned with him no not for him i auditioned for rojinsky mm -hmm. who took care of the personnel and i almost did not audition you know I was doing some commercial work and I was doing very well. My wife, who was a wonderful violinist, mm -hmm. thought, well, I should wait until something better shows up. She didn't like this whole idea of commercialism. Mm -hmm. And I was beginning, and I'm, I'm a little bit ashamed to tell you, I was beginning to feel rather satisfied mm -hmm. with what was going on. Broadway shows? And, and not only Broadway shows, I mean, I did a lot of uh, commercial work. Mm -hmm. I played some good programs I played with Kostelanitz, who was an excellent conductor, even then, but music really didn't amount to much. Mm -hmm. And when my wife saw the announcement of Toscanini uh, coming to NBC, she said, you know, why don't you audition for that? And I said, well, I hear that he's a mean man, he throws uh, tantrums, <laughs> he, he balls people out. I don't think so. 
He said, I'll tell you what. Why don't you take the audition and see whether you can make it? You may not be able to even get in. Uh -huh. Ah, that didn't sit well with me. <laughs> I started to work especially hard, and I didn't make it. Uh -huh. I was in the first violin section of the embassy for seven years. Then I went to Detroit as concertmaster of the orchestra there. Then after three years, I was engaged by George Sell to be concertmaster of the Cleveland Orchestra. Mm -hmm. right. That was a highlight. That was a highlight. Because he was such a superb musician. Mm -hmm. His knowledge, for instance, of the orchestral instrument, I've never met the like. Mm -hmm. I never met his like. Mm -hmm. To give you an example, mm -hmm. I think the most embarrassing moment I ever had was as concertmaster. Naturally, I was supposed to be the best violinist and the leader, and occasionally I would be called upon to play a passage to illustrate something, and I did very well. But one day we were reading a contemporary work. The music was put on the stands, and I was going all over the place. It was difficult. Mm -hmm. And Zell was conducting. He looks at me and said, Joe, stay in the fourth position. It's all there for you. <laughs> He was right. And I could have killed him. I was so mad. But he was right. He was right. He was right, absolutely. He was right most of the time. And I stayed 13 years uh -huh. as concert master. He was a rough one. Ooh. Yeah, demanding, know. demanding. But like Toscanini, the biggest demand he made was that on himself. You see? Mm -hmm. He never asked you to do anything that you that he wouldn't, for instance, do better. So you didn't feel that he was, he was, well, he was demanding, but not unfair. No, he was not unfair. Occasionally, uh, well, like any human being, not only like any conductor, but any human being, he had his days, mm -hmm. you know, but he made that orchestra sound like the most glorious string quartet. The string the strings of the orchestra were just impeccable. I mean, the ensemble, the precision. Mm -hmm. We take a great pride in that. Mm -hmm. And you know something? He had his own Boeings for mm -hmm. all the classical works. I've heard that, and they're still in the library. At well, Sarenson. they are lucky, and I hope they yeah. are being used because they cannot be improved upon. Yeah. His... Um, uh, he went through and just... And he had, his, as I said, his own bones, and um, they were conceived from a musical point of view, not from a violinistic point of view. Mm -hmm. And occasionally, they seemed a little uncomfortable, but as Shakespeare said, the action suited the word, and the word suited the action. Mm -hmm. And That's times... Right. Some of the boys in the orchestra, my section, would come. He said, you know, this is awkward. He said, I said, look, there are his Boeings. He said, this is awkward. Tell him. Mm -hmm. I said, you tell him. Mm -hmm. And of course, they shut up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nobody dared. Yeah. And sometimes they felt a little awkward. And then you get used to that. And you saw how they fit mm -hmm. into the entire picture. Mm -hmm. It was great. Now, my next... The most important highlight was when I came to Indiana University to teach. And that was about 1960? 1960. I've been here almost 25 years. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, how did this... That, how did that decision, how did you make that decision? What, uh, well, let me tell you, it's a, uh, you see, during my tenure of the Cleveland, uh, uh, tenure of the Cleveland Orchestra, four times, I was offered concert masterships in different orchestras, twice in Philadelphia, okay. once in Chicago, and once in Los Angeles. When these offers came, I went to Zell and said, George, I'm not asking for a raise in salary, and I don't want you to construe this as, as something personal for me. But 
you know what the business is like. Rumors get around, and before you know it, I'm already in Philadelphia, I'm already in Chicago. I'm simply telling you what happened. I turned it down, and that was it. For the fourth time this happened, within a period of about eight years. He said, I said, I turned it down again. I said, he said, it's wonderful. I said, I would never take the position in another orchestra but Cleveland. However, I said, you know, someday uh, I hope maybe to have an offer to go to a great music school or to a university because I don't want to play uh, until I'm 65 years old. I don't know how. George said, if that should happen, not only will I let you go, but I'll even help you get the position because of your wonderful service to the, this orchestra and your admirable playing and so forth. Well, and Dean Bain called me one day and I was in New Mexico at the time playing a chamber music uh, uh, festival. He, co he dragged me down. In, no, no, in Albuquerque at the June Music Festival. I played for 25 years. Mm -hmm. Every June we had eight concerts. And he got me, he, he tracked me down and Dean Bain said, would you be interested in discussing the possibility of your coming mm -hmm. to Indiana University School of Music? And I said to him, but you have Zatoretsky, who is a magnificent teacher and a marvelous violinist, since he passed away three days ago. Mm -hmm. So I told him, I said, I have just signed a contract with the Cleveland Orchestra. And it's for three years. And he said, I, I need you right now. I said, I'm sorry. I, I was hoping some someday to get a position like this. And I was just turning 50. Mm -hmm. Well, all right, I went back to Cleveland. Mm -hmm. I just put my violin and suitcase down when the phone rang and was Dean Bain again. I said, in the last four days, I've contacted 20 different people. 18 gave me your name. <laughs> he says, come down to Bloomington and let's, let's just talk a little while and see our campus and all that. So he said, when can you get there? I said, when do you want me? He says, tomorrow. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got a ticket in those days, it wasn't so difficult. And I came down here, and I just loved the campus and everything. And I told him of my contract, he says, listen, my dear, if you can get the release of one year, then I will get someone else for one year to substitute for you. And I said, okay, I wrote to self who wrote me a rather strong letter. And he said, all right, I once promised you that I would even help you. I don't want to stand in your way. But on condition that you get on the phone and call about 10 people who are suitable to be concert master here. I did that right away. Nobody wanted to work with him. He was tough, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Well, finally, they got a hold of Raphael Druyan. Mm -hmm. and by the time Zell came back, we had discussed it. He said, okay, Joe, I'll let you go. Mm -hmm. And we were very good friends. Mm -hmm. It wasn't uh, uh, not a parting of the ways at all. He simply thought it would be a wonderful idea for me to have this mm -hmm. position. And I called Bain, and Bain happened to be in Salzburg at the time when Zell was conducting. In, he tells this story so beautifully. He said, you know, they have a list in the newspaper of the names of all the tourists that have come. They have about 100 names a day. Mm -hmm. He said, Zell found my name. <laughs> he was incredible. <laughs> he found out where I was and he said, let's talk. <laughs> and he tried to dissuade Bain from uh, engaging me. Mm -hmm. He said, because he means so much to me and the orchestra. Well, Zell, uh, uh, 
he said, look, he's going to mean a lot to us too. And he's given me his word mm -hmm. via your word. Mm -hmm. That was it. Mm -hmm. I came here and I have done a lot. I think my career, per se, started here because I did so many things outside of my teaching duties. I have been a jurist representing the United States, and I'll tell you, Queen Elizabeth in Brussels three times, Paganini three times, Sibelius competition in Helsinki, mm -hmm. Munich, Munich, uh, uh, Odense, that's in, uh, that's in uh, Denmark, and um, yeah, I can't even remember, oh, Wieniawski in Poland. Mm. Um, wait, 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 just a second. Wieniawski, Poland, I, I had it down to 10 once. In Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky, Tchaikovsky yeah. that's right. And Tchaikovsky, uh, oh, I'll come up with, anyway, I came up with 11 trip in New York, that's mm -hmm. eight. Uh, I, can, I can recall the others. And I've given, all right, we'll, we'll, that's mm -hmm. enough. And I've given master classes mm -hmm. during these years in 30 different conservatories or universities. Mm -hmm. I have a list of them. Mm -hmm. so okay. At the Toho School in Japan, at the Danish Radio Orchestra, that's a professional orchestra. Oh, I worked, the top orchestra. I worked with the string section for a whole week. Uh-huh. It was great. Mm -hmm. Those men were so wonderful. I didn't even want to accept what they offered me because it was a professional orchestra. And I knew that these people, professional musicians, you know, you get up in front of them and say, well, all right, show us. And they, they would <laughs> resent it no matter how. But there was no such attitude. They were marvelous. Mm -hmm. And I, since I'm not a conductor, one of the conductors, conducted the rehearsal only. I stopped him whenever I had something to say. Mm -hmm. This is the way I worked. And then I did an enormous repertoire in one week with them. I did the Heldenleben, uh, mm -hmm. Don Juan, a Death and Transfiguration, uh, uh, and uh, Ernest Spiegel. Then I did Mozart, 39, 40, 41. Well, it was about seven hours a day. Oh 41, Beethoven, of Maroica. Uh, overtures to Oberon, uh, Oberon, let me see, Oberon, uh, Freischutz, um, Egmont, uh, Leonora III. Anyway, that's about it. And when in working, and every time I stopped the conductor, I had something to say to the section, you know, I never used any music. Mm -hmm. And I was doing this. Mm -hmm. At the end of the four the five days I think it was mm -hmm. uh, they gave me such a wonderful ovation it was marvelous you know mm -hmm. and um, then one of the men the principal we all said it but it's so remarkable to us that you do everything by memory and I never gave it any thought mm -hmm. I said oh my god every conductor that comes here conducts by memory what's so good uh, great about them they said yeah but you know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and this, um, and they did a beautiful thing for me. I, I left uh, two days after that. I, I went back home, and I had a, a ticket from uh, Copenhagen mm -hmm. to to, sh to, sh to Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I was I was traveling uh, tourist class. And then before takeoff, there was an announcement on the intercom uh, saying, will Mr. Joseph Gingo please identify himself by ringing the button? Mm -hmm. I couldn't understand. For, I got a little frightened because there was the bad news or something. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> the um, man, the steward came over and he said, we have a message from the... Uh, Danish radio orchestra asking you to please be their guest by traveling first class. Oh, yeah. And they found that they had reserved the seat and everything. It wasn't mm -hmm. that nice. Uh, I've had some wonderful things. And then 
And this is this is a lot. It's a very good. The Cleveland Institute, Oberlin College, the Blossom Festival School, um, Eastman School, and the Conservatoire in, in in Montreal, the uh, the Canadian Chamber Orchestra, um, Los Angeles Institute, Manhattan School mm. in New York. I had the Michael Manchair for two years, mm -hmm. and the New England Conservatory in Boston, and University of Denver, Honolulu. Uh, the Conservatory in St. Louis and the Duke University in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And this is only part of it. So it's all of this opened up to you because yeah. you can't use And, and also being asked to become, uh, to represent the United States and all these mm -hmm. different... That was uh, a great honor. Was great yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. And from that, you see, the, the most exciting thing happened is that um, I was approached by some, by the uh, musical... Um, What's the name? Uh, had a musical director. No, that's not the right uh, word. Just a moment. He is Mr. Betskevich in in uh, who represents his musical artistic director of the Cathedral Arts in Indianapolis, and Curtis Clark, who's now president of the Indianapolis Symphony, mm -hmm. and they approached me about having a, a competition. Oh, I didn't in know. here and. In I, Indianapolis. In Indianapolis, it was terrific. Mm -hmm. The highest standard, even for me, even as high as Tchaikovsky or Queen Elizabeth. When did that take place? It Virginia? took place in 82, uh -huh. okay. in September. We have another one coming up in 86. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be again honorary chairman mm -hmm. and president of the jury, as I was last time. And the official name of the competition? The Indianapolis um, Violin. International, Indianapolis International Violin Competition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 